Hey, everybody. Uh, let's get that right. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah good. All right. Um, so, as mentioned, I'm Alexis Deveria. Uh, I work at Adobe, but I also am the creator and maintainer of um, the web compatibility site caniuse.com. So, um, in this talk, I'm first going to talk a little bit about the site for those of you unfamiliar with it, um, and then I'm going to talk about the top features listed there that uh, we as developers can start using today. So basically in um, 2008, that's around the time when uh, a lot of different web browsers were starting to implement different uh, new specifications, HTML5, CSS3, uh, that kind of things. And as a web developer, I thought it was really cool, the neat kind of experimental things that were really starting to appear in these browsers. But uh, I wasn't able to see exactly what was supported where. And there were existing compatibility sites that had information for uh, like older technologies. And that was nice, but uh, there wasn't really much out for the things that were appearing in the latest experimental builds. and. Uh, back then, you know, it would be like another year before another browser would come up, but they were starting to show all these cool prototypes. Uh, so I thought it would be useful to just have one resource where you could look up this information. Um, so I decided to make one. Uh, in 2009, that's when I launched a site called When Can I Use? Um, so the idea was to have a quick overview to support, see the support for the different web technologies, but also to uh, see exactly what web browsers were kind of holding the web back. Because as I'm sure most of you know, um, especially Internet Explorer was lagging behind in supporting the cool new stuff. And uh, it seemed like a good opportunity to also visualize, hey, there's a lot of red here in the IE column. Uh, be nice if you guys would do something about that, which actually they have uh, over the past years, especially i10 is looking great. So, um, but going back, um, uh, the site grew from there. At first, there were just a couple of features, and then I made it more interactive and let you sort on the different categories um, and add things like uh, mobile browsers. Started with just desktop browsers. As you can see here, this is just a screenshot from what it was like in 2009. Um, and so it's been really a good experience working on the site and updating it for me personally too because uh, it forced me to keep up with the latest technologies and uh, learn a lot about the latest web tech. It has been really cool. So here's what uh, the main site looks like today. Um, there's, as you can see, there's the lists of lots of different features uh, in different categories. Um, and. So here's quickly what one of the support tables looks like. Uh, we'll go into a bit more detail later about what uh, the different kind of things are that are on the site. Uh, so why would you be interested in kind of use aside from just um, looking up support? So it's got support information for uh, 130 plus features. It's what it's up to now. Um, HTML5, CSS3, SVG, uh, different APIs, different file formats. Uh, it's all client-side web technologies. And um, uh, it provides a good, quick overview of basic browser support. So features are either, uh, as, a, as they appear on the site, they're either supported, partially supported, or not supported. Uh, so there's not, uh, just looking at the tables, it's good for just a quick reference to see if something's supported or not. Uh, but there are also, uh, you can see the known issues, which is like a list of bugs that people may have sent in, as well as uh, links to other resources. Uh, for example, um, we got there's references, uh, polyfills, and blog posts related to each feature. So even if the, you know, um, if you want to know part of the support for a certain feature, you can look at those to find out more. There's also, you can see the, the percentage of users with supporting browsers. So even though you might see like a lot of green on a table, if it's n a feature isn't supported by like the major players or the major versions, then that doesn't mean much. 
So you can see, uh, based, calculated based on the stat counter data, uh, what um, percentage of users approximately supports a given feature. And the number one priority of can I use is uh, to keep it up to date with the latest browser versions, especially since uh, Chrome and Firefox are on like six week update intervals. Uh, so what I do is every time I find out about a release, I run it through my test suite and see what kind of information or what kind of things I've changed since the last version. And I try to update it within like 24 hours. So that you can know that whenever you visit caniuse.com or get information from there, uh, you know that the latest information is up to date. And because it's really easy on other websites for that kind of information to go stale. Um, so that's something I try to, even if I don't have, always have time to add like the latest uh, features, uh, keeping it up to date is the number one thing. Uh, a couple of other things. Uh, can I use accept supports from the community uh, via GitHub? So on GitHub, you can see JSON files um, that, uh, in, that have all the data for each feature. And anybody is welcome to uh, modify this or you know, add corrections or add links or add bugs. And in fact, you can also add new uh, web features there. And a couple of people have added some uh, features since, uh, since I started doing that, which is really great. Uh, there's also a feedback form for anybody who doesn't like to mess with GitHub and just wants to post a correction. Each feature just has a little feedback form, and I'll review that and update the site if necessary. Uh, you can also import Google Analytics data to see the support based on your own site's users. So I mentioned the stat counter data, and that's all very well to get a kind of a rough idea of how many users there are. But if you use Google Analytics on your site to track your visitors, you can actually import that data. And then you can see uh, feature by feature what percentage of your users can use a certain feature. So that can be very useful if you have that. Uh, browser versions shown on the table are based on usage. So this can be a little bit confusing if you, and I'll show you the feature in just a moment. Um, originally, I had like a far past and a past and a current versions, but that kind of got complicated with, especially with the quick update cycles from Chrome and Firefox. So now the versions you see are uh, based on a certain usage threshold. Uh, so by default, it's like 1%. That's why by default, if you look at the site now, you don't see IE6 because according to the site country data, it's like used by less than 1% of the global visitors. Uh, but you can actually, there's a slider under the options panel where you can adjust that and see older versions if you need to. You can also compare the support of multiple browser versions. There's a comparison feature uh, where you see a list of all browser versions tracked on the site. You can uh, click multiple ones and see them side by side and see exactly what browser supports what and all the differences therein. Uh, then finally, there's um, at the bottom of, if you have a list of features, or if you like looking at a category view, or just all features, at the bottom you'll see a summary table that shows the support, total support percentage of each browser version. So you can actually like compare, uh, see how well each browser version is doing. For example, again, uh, compare the improvements in I nine and 10 and see how much those have improved uh, as well as the mobile browsers. It's pretty good to know exactly how they kind of compare. Uh, so going back to this slide, um, so let me see. Okay, see my cursor. Uh, so over here, this is where you see the usage data I mentioned. Uh, right here you can see both global and custom. So global is the stack counter data. This says that 76% uh, of users worldwide approximately can use the WAF fonts. Uh, and since my own viewers uh, tend to use newer browsers, that percentage is uh, higher for my, uh, since I use Google Analytics, I was able to import that. And so that's a much higher number. Um, so you can see there's some empty spots here. That's because like Chrome 22 and 
Chrome 21 just don't have enough users to really matter. Uh, but, you know, other browsers like Firefox 16 might have a higher percentage. Um, you can also just click on show all versions here and that will actually populate the table with all the versions tracked on the site. And down here there are tabs with notes, known issues, uh, resources, and a feedback form that I mentioned before, as well as over here the edit on GitHub link. A couple of features that are coming in 2013. Uh, there's a new design coming up by uh, Leonard Horse, who was uh, very kind to um, redesign the site, and I hadn't really had time to work on the design myself, so that should be a very welcome addition. Uh, I'm working with him on implementing that sometime soon, hopefully. Of course, more web technology features and more browsers, probably more mobile browsers, um, will be added on the site as time goes on. Um, better notes on partial support. What that refers to is, so partial support just by itself doesn't really mean much. It doesn't, it varies wildly but, um, depending on the feature, what that means. Right now it's kind of mentioned in the notes, but it's pretty vague and I'd like a more visual way of showing the, what the partial support means in different browsers. Uh, also, uh, since Stack Counter provides information on gif different geographic regions, uh, I'd like that to be an option for users so they can just, for those uh, that, like the Google Analytics import would still, of course, give you the best data, but uh, as an alternative, it's much better to have your own geographic region um, to uh, use that data from there. Uh, so the, for the next part of my talk, I'm going to talk about some features uh, that you can start using today that do not require polyfills. Uh, you don't have to you know, think about it or worry about it. Uh, you can just use it. And you see that little asterisk there that refers to the fact that you're not supporting IE6 or 7. Uh, are there any of you who are still actively testing in IE6 and 7? No. <laughs> I, see, I see a couple of hands there. So uh, maybe next year for you guys. Uh, so, so these are features and the reason that I picked these was they've been like on the site since it started and um, and probably quite a few of you are, are actually already familiar with them but I think it's important that we really understand hey okay these features are around now they're supported in i8 I can just start using these without giving it a second thought just as much as any other thing that you're uh, familiar with um, so the takeaway I hope you get from the end of this is, okay, these are features I'm going to start using and there's some cool stuff I can do with them and I don't need to worry about compatibility. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about some uh, related features that are not yet um, supported cross-browser but uh, that do relate to these features and it's good to have in mind that uh, some newer things are coming. Uh, so here you see a list of things that are supported in i8. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them r right now. The underlined ones are the one I'm talking about, but just for a quick glance, you can see the kind of stuff we're talking about. Uh, so let's start with CSS tables. So CSS tables have the advantage of uh, HTML tables, except they don't have the table semantics that come with HTML tables. So um, when layout started in the web development world, tables were the main way of doing things. It was a great way to just kind of position things here and there. But uh, since then, of course, we've learned that tables should really just be used for tabular data and uh, we should style our uh, things with CSS. Um, but the problem is, you know, we don't really have a good layout mechanism in place just yet. So we usually use things like floats, but CSS tables kind of, uh, you know, you just use things like divs and you can still position things as tables and you don't have that extra um, table semantic issue. Uh, there are some downsides to using CSS tables. You can't uh, do a cell span or a row span as you can with HTML attributes. Um, 
and there are other limitations like you can't use relative or absolute positioning of cells. Um, so how, here's a quick example. So you can set like a parent element, set the display to table and child element as table cell. I'll see, you note that I actually skipping a table row here and that's, that's really fine. Um, it, it actually works without that. There's a couple of, you know, sort of shortcuts you can do. So in this example with this content, you can have like two columns here and any amount of content you have in this area, uh, the background will still just fill up as if these are table cells. But you don't have to really think about it as a table, just think, hey, I want, you know, these two elements that I know are gonna be next to each other and I don't want one to be pushed away because I just wanted to act like table cells. Uh, another nice feature about table cells is you can use display table cell on a parent element to vertically align any content. Uh, so anybody who's tried to vertically align things in CSS has noticed that it's not always that easy. Um, but there's a really easy trick. You just set your element as table cell, set vertical align to middle, and uh, regardless of the height of your content, that will um, be vertically centered. Uh, one thing to note here is that you can't, as often you'll do this with an element that you want to absolutely position, but you can't do that because that changes the display back to block basically, and so you lose that, but you can use, you can still use like a wrapper element to get around that. Uh, so beyond tables, there's a really nice um, specification called uh, Flexbox. It's known as a flexible layout module, and that is something uh, that provides much better layout. Um, you can, you basically lay out just rows and columns, and um, you have much more control over how those are displayed. As you can see, the support is coming nicely. Here you can see a lot of partial support. That means that they're, mostly means that they're using an older version of the spec, um, but it's all coming up in the future, so eventually we'll be able to use that. There's also the CSS grid layout, which is uh, something that we've first seen in IE10. It's also a really nice way to, uh, to position elements based on a grid, which sounds a bit like tables, but the uh, actual way you do it is quite different, uh, but it's also very powerful. And even though it's only in IE10 right now, I believe WebKit is currently working on it, so we should hopefully see more implementations of that. Next, pseudo elements and generated content. So pseudo elements are like the before and after uh, pseudo selectors in CSS and they basically create two uh, elements for every, or up to two elements for any specified HTML element. Uh, the generated content refers to the content that you put in that element using the content property. Uh, so in this example, you can see I've got this element that by itself just has the word this. Uh, but using this selector, I can set the before content to this arrow and the after content to an exclamation point and that gives me something like this. So this is just a really basic example. And an important thing to note with this is that you, um, that the content appears inside the element. It doesn't appear like even though it says before, it's referring to before the content of the element, not before the element itself. So because the element is green, the before content will also be green because it appears in the same element. Uh, so what can you do exactly with these two elements? You can uh, use characters or character icons to prepend to elements. Uh, you can use multiple backgrounds and multiple borders because even though uh, there's a CSS3 spec that says that you can uh, use multiple backgrounds for elements. Uh, that's not something supported in IE8, but you can use at least up to three backgrounds by, you know, using this or create more borders. Uh, you still have to do some tweaking with the positioning of these elements, of course, but you can position them absolutely and then, you know, relatively and gives you a lot more control over them. Uh, I can create pure CSS shapes. That's something that's becoming more popular to create different effects. Um, layout issue fixes, sometimes you just need an extra element to do something and adding that to your markup just is messy and you don't want to do that if you don't have to. 
So you can do that with before and after. Um, another neat thing is in the content property, aside from uh, putting strings, you can, there's some special functions you can use like to display images or this one is the attribute function which lets you display the content of an attribute. So for example, on a printed page, if you'd want to have links appear, you can use this to um, show the value of the href in a link uh, for your print style sheet and that will actually display the link. Uh, so here's, there's lots more things you can do um, on CSS tricks, for example. There's a pseudo element roundup that I actually got quite a few of these examples from. Um, so I recommend looking more into that for examples of things you can do. Uh, you may also wonder, well, if I can do before, can I use before before to create even more pseudo elements? Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not quite possible just yet, but uh, there's an Adobe specification, uh, sort of, I think it was Adobe that started it and is working on it and being discussed in the CSS working group uh, that will, it, it won't look like this, but it will let you define exactly, uh, you can, you'd, I think you'd have like any unlimited amount of pseudo elements that you can define in CSS for each element, so that should allow for a bunch of cool things. Uh, next, CSS counters. Those are, uh, that's actually a specific function you can use in your generated content. Uh, you can use the counter reset property and counter increment. So you set up an identifier for your counter and with reset and increment, every time it hits those elements, uh, that value is actually, so increment increases it and reset resets it, obviously. So in this example, um, these are like chapter headings and if you set the content to chapter, your counter, and this hyphen, and starts looking like this. So it's a way to control how you can use numbers and still have content in between it. So unlike ordered lists where you're kind of limited to what you can do, uh, this gives you control over how your numbers appear. That's kind of a neat feature. Not terribly useful in a lot of cases, but it's good to know that we can start using it today. Uh, another one, uh, CSS outline. So outline is a lot like border. It has similar properties. Uh, so width, style, and the color, and the same shorthand. Uh, but the important thing about outline is that it never affects uh, size or layout of your element. Uh, and that makes it good for uh, things like highlighting elements. Uh, it surrounds the CSS border, so you can also just use it as a second border. If you need that for whatever reason. Um, again, useful for debugging or highlighting. So in this example, so here we just have a two pixel solid red border around this element. Uh, if we apply an outline, you, you'll notice it doesn't push any elements away. It just sticks it over it. Um, again, so that's sort of a magical kind of effect. Uh, session storage and local storage. Um, these are two storage mechanisms that provide uh, better and more storage um, than cookies. For a session in local storage, you get up to five megabytes of storage space per site. I think, I think I've also seen it extended to 10 megabytes rather than the measly approximately four kilobytes you get from cookies. So that means you can actually like store, uh, in, if you have a web app, you can store temporary data for files that are being modified or uh, anything else that's going on um, that requires a lot more data. Um, there's a much friendlier API, so for cookies you normally want to write your own functions and it's kind of a pain uh, to deal with that, but for uh, local storage you can use just set item and get item to store things based on a certain key. And no data is sent to the server with session storage and local storage, it's all client side where cookies would share the data with the server. Uh, here is an example. Uh, so you can just do set item, my string to foo, set item, my object, and so you, right now I don't think any browsers support um, storing data other than strings, but you can use the JSON API to convert any object or array into a string and uh, store it like that. And you'll also be happy to know that JSON is one of the, I don't 
talk about it separately here, but uh, it's also supported in IE8, so you can uh, safely use that in conjunction with session and local storage. Um, and retrieving it is just as easy, get item, and using JSON parse to get the item as if it's an object. So beyond local storage, another storage mechanism coming up is um, IndexedDB, uh, which lets you store and retrieve data from a database. So it lets you do client-side database operations if you store uh, things in your IndexedDB. As you can see, support for that is uh, coming along too. And then there's also the file API, directory and systems, which uh, lets you store and retrieve data as files. Right now that's only supported in Chrome and the latest version of BlackBerry browser. Um, I'm not sure if other browsers are necessarily going to implement that. We'll still have to see. Um, and one thing to note here is that even though you store things as files, it's like a sandbox file system, so it doesn't really interact with your other files on, on your computer, which can be good or bad. It means because if you actually store the things as a file, you might expect you could just go to Explorer or Finder and find the files, but it doesn't quite work that way. It's a bit weird. But. Uh, hash change event, it's a DOM event that fires under a couple of different conditions. Well, basically it's anytime anything after the hash sign changes, but uh, so the user can change it. It happens on internal navigation, so uh, any link that points to something else on the page. Uh, if the location.hash is changed, that will trigger it, as well as the back and forward buttons, uh, provided that you know, you're just changing anything behind the hash. And so that last one is important, and it's used in a lot of web apps nowadays for uh, controlling the way things happen. For example, in Gmail, I, I don't know for sure if it works this way, but an example would be like if you're in your inbox and you click on an email, and uh, it shows the email, but it didn't actually like load another page. Uh, you just press the back button and it goes back. So that can be easily done using the hash change event because you notice you just, you just intercept that um, the hash change and um, change the behavior on the page as, as necessary as what you want based on the new location. Uh, beyond hash change, there's the session history management. Specification, uh, that's um, it's part of HTML5. It uh, gives you more control. It's a little bit similar to has change, but actually lets you change the location, the domain. Uh, on the same domain, you can change the URL to, um, to anything you like, really, and uh, manage the way the browser history has happened on your site and uh, change things based on that. So. That is also uh, coming along. As you can see, it's pretty well supported nowadays. Uh, next, CSS text overflow ellipsis. Um, this is actually a feature that, for the longest time, it was supported in IE, but uh, Firefox hadn't been supporting it. But they've had a support for quite some time now, so you can safely use it. Um, what, the way it works is you have to uh, actually set three different um, properties is aside from text overflow ellipsis, it only adds the three dots at the end of the line. Uh, if you include uh, set the white space to no wrap and overflow to hidden or anything that's not visible uh, to get this effect. And it's important to note that it only works for single lines, uh, not wrapping text. So you can't say, for example, I want you know, the height to be this much, or I want three lines and then end on ellipsis. So it's a little bit limited that way, but it's good if you've only got like a short amount of text that you want to end in a more uh, appealing way than just cut off. Uh, so good for variable lengths of text that just preview the content that you'd like click on and see the rest of it. And finally, I get to uh, data URIs for images. So with data URIs, are there basically files that are serialized as a single string, so a very large string most of the time. Um, you can use them in, uh, you can actually create data URIs for different file formats, but uh, IE mostly supports it as images. 
So in this example, you can see setting uh, it in the star sheet as uh, image. So you put it wherever you'd normally put an image path. You can put it just in your HTML2, but by using it in CSS, it makes a good alternative to using sprites because so it's, what sprites are is if when you take a bunch of images and you put them in just one image uh, and then you do some background positioning to um, make the different images appear and the advantage of doing that rather than just using lots of different images is to reduce the amount of HTTP requests. But if you can just put the data URIs all in one style sheet, uh, as long as you're not duplicating any content, um, uh, you can, you know, you just have the HTTP request of the style sheet and you're not actually loading any more resources beyond that. Um, an important thing to note is that you do want to make sure you, uh, you serve your file gzipped because otherwise, because they're base64 encoded, the file will actually be bigger than the image by itself. But if you serve it as gzipped, then, you know, you still get that, uh, the advantage to that. And then there's the, uh, Important limitation to IE8 is that the maximum file size is 32 kilobytes. Um, that's bigger in IE9 and IE10, I believe. But uh, uh, but 32k is actually uh, often okay for things like icons and uh, small images that you would actually mostly use in CSS anyway. Um, so it actually works pretty well for them. Uh, so that is the end of my presentation. Um, you can contact me on Twitter. Can I use for related to the site or bird for me? Um, or hit my email. Um, so if anybody has any questions, either about the technologies I talked about or about the Can I Use site itself, um, that's your chance. Thank you.